So one of the things in my swing I've been really working on is trying to get rid of my early extension. When I watch myself on video, it's something that, especially with the longer clubs like the driver, really starts to show up. And today we're going to talk about if that's even a problem to worry about in the first place, what might be causing it, and some ways to potentially work on it if it's a problem that you have as well. You know, I've worked with lots of people and we're getting lots of viewers. Hopefully everybody's appreciating some of the things. and. You know, I'll be the first one to admit that I don't know everything about everything. <laughs> sure. And um, uh, early extension to me, I, I don't know what the answers are, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Do I see it with players? Yeah, I see it. Um, do I work on it very often in a lesson? Um, no, I don't. And uh, I think as, as you've got lots of questions and really great questions, and so as we go through this, I'll try to give you my opinion and, and, and should you worry about it or not. The main thing I think that we kind of discussed before we got the camera started was that um, I think your body does things um, during a golf swing because it has to, that it's reactionary. So if a player is early extending, that's not the problem, that's the symptom of something of that's problem. causing yeah. a different problem that's causing that. Or, it, like we said, it's their way of generating club speed. You, you know, everybody's trying to hit it farther and farther and farther, and you see what the potential is when you watch the elite players and how far everybody can hit it today. Mm -hmm. And we talk about ground forces and... And that is one way to use the ground to, so to get some speed. It is. One way is vertical. Yeah. There's vertical pressure into the ground that develops speed. Um, for me, at my age, uh, you know, I was taught to maintain your posture when you swing. And so that would be no early extension. That yeah. I have a knee flex and a back angle, and I keep it all the way through to my finish. And so... That's the way I was taught, you know, 40 years ago to, to swing a golf club. Mm -hmm. um, I do think older instructors like me um, tend to think early extension's more of a problem than a lot of the younger instructions that have force plates and all that stuff and that are trying to get people to use the ground yeah. more. Does that make sense? Well, yes. it's probably one of the big reasons that people worry about it at all is that you tend to lose your posture when you, you do. do it, right? So if you have a nice golf posture here and then you stand up out of it, all of a sudden you're, it's gonna change everything and, and potentially maybe cause you to flip if it's... It could, and, but what just happened when you did that, mm -hmm. how high above the ground was your club head? Probably. Two feet, yeah. <laughs> Six inches yeah. or eight inches or ten inches, right? right? Right, And so that is what happens when you early extend. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by I think it's reactionary. For players um, that might be casting where the club would bottom out behind the ball too early, or they're too flat on the way down where the club would bottom out on the way early, they almost have to early extend to hit the ball and not the turf and not to stick the club yeah. in the ground. And so that's what I mean by reactionary. And, um, and I think that's, as, as, as I'm playing these days, my worst shot really is, there's a couple of them, but my worst shot is high right, weak high right. And I can tell I early extend, but I, but in my own game, I don't know Am I early extending and causing the club to get behind me and to the right? Or is it just the club is behind me and to the right? And if I didn't early extend, I would chunk it. Sure. And I think our subconsciouses are that smart yeah. to know what it takes to make contact with the ball. And so that, again, is why I think that early extension, you know, is reactionary rather, rather than... Uh, something that you so you've got to fix what's causing that rather than the early extension right. itself. Now there's some great drills um, that a lot of great instructors talk about. Michael Breed talks about his famous one is you get your butt up against a wall and you turn and you feel this right cheek stay on the wall and then you feel this left cheek stay on the wall 
and you do that every day for 10 minutes and you ought to be able to feel that you can stay in that posture. Um, don't disagree with it. Turn around and go that way, Patrick, like just like you're going to hit a shot there. You know, I've seen players put a bumper here, you know, and that you're going to feel like, feel like that, that stays on it all the way through mm -hmm. and all the way through to the finish. And and you'll work on that. Well, uh, and I notice when I when I'm doing it well, I, I feel different muscles activating than when I don't do it well. So if I if I take my normal swing where I do overextend, it's like I feel zero activation in my butt muscles, my like legs, hamstrings. It's just, they're almost completely passive. Whereas uh -huh. when I do feel this, I, I feel tons of activation. And these are some of the biggest muscles we have in our right. whole body. Some yeah. of the most powerful. If you go to the gym, the leg press, stuff like that, right. some of the ways to move the most weight, the most power. So it makes sure. sense that you, you ideally want to be using these and feeling these to get more power in your swing. Mm -hmm. I agree. One of the things you asked me about off camera was, should I feel like I keep my chest down? Right. Okay, um, and my opinion of that is no, it's not your chest's fault. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing if for a beginner who's topping the ball, everybody tells them to keep your head down, but your head can't do anything. If you cut your head off and laid it on the ground, it'll just sit there. <laughs> and so by keeping, if your head is raising up and down, or if you're early extending, it has nothing to do with this upper body. It has to do with your hips and your glutes and your hamstrings and, and your core. And so, in my opinion, that's, that's at least the areas you should be trying to feel what they feel like when you do it correctly. And so, can, does keeping your chest down, if, you're, if you don't early extend, does your chest stay down? Well, yes, it does. But, it, but maybe, maybe uh, some players keeping their chest down activates them in the hips what they want to feel. So I won't tell you that maybe that doesn't work for you, but from a common sense point of view to me, it doesn't make sense to think about your chest or your head if it's not their fault. Yeah. And so I would rather you think about you know, your hips or the small of your back or the angle or what that pressure feels like in your butt as you do that. Mm -hmm. And I think you would be more successful that way. But gosh, you know, you, you guys that are watching this video watch more videos than I do probably. Maybe not Patrick. I, I watch a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you'll, at least what I've seen is that Half the guys tell you early extension's okay, and then half the guys tell you it's one of the biggest flaws in the swing. I can just tell you, from me, just an old golf pro, I try to get people to swing on the correct path and keep the face square and be the correct distance from the ball and aim correctly. And I kind of still focus most of my instruction on that rather than to go down some of these long tunnels yeah. uh, instruction. Does that make sense? Well, and one of the things you've talked about before, I think even on a video we've done, is that one of the consequences of the early extension is it can change your club face a little bit, right? Because it, it can, can yes. kind of artificially open, open it because it, yes. you're right. standing more tall instead of being more over in your posture. Correct, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And so maybe by thinking about having the club face in the right position, it would also assume that you wouldn't early extend. Yeah. I, I don't know, it's a chicken and the egg thing, which comes first. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that. Um, but uh, when I watch players hit balls and stuff like that, I can usually, you know, figure out what's going on enough to do that. Yeah. I, I would say of 30 or 40 people these days that I see a week, I might talk about early extension once every 100 people, okay. and that's it. Yep. And I always am working on some other aspect, even though I see it, and even the, and I'll have people, if, when I show them their video, they'll say, well, I'm early extended, and I'll say, yes, you are. <laughs> and uh, until 10 years ago, nobody in the golf world even knew that term. I mean, that's really how new it is, yeah. probably. And uh, um, but I still don't, I still think it's reactionary 
uh, for most players uh, rather than the issue that's causing them to hit poor shots in their swing. There's something else going wrong. Well, yeah. speaking of that, I saw a really great video from TPI, the Titleist Performance uh -huh. Institute. We're both big fans of that, they're what, everything great they big do, fans, really. Yes. And they had a really cool video about the correlation between ankle stiffness and immobility and likelihood of early extending. And I wonder sometimes for myself, I have really tight ankles. It's something I'm working on and trying to get more flexible all the time. But I wonder sometimes if some of my early extensions may be a body limitation that it's like I'm, you know, not able to get in certain positions naturally and so my body kind of compensates especially maybe when you're really applying more force with like a driver yeah maybe and that's what i mean that's where you know i kind of have to depend on experts like greg rose and them at tpi um, uh, who i've seen speak quite a few times and um and and i don't doubt that that's the case and that flexibility limitations could cause that but still, for me, and for probably most of you guys out there, um, if you do have limitations and, 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 and body issues like I do at my age these days, the, I still think the more you think about how to swing the club like the flashlight drill and all that is still the way to go in terms of improving your ball striking and improving your shots. I still think you're better thinking about what the golf club's doing than what your body's doing. And there'd be lots of people that would disagree with me on that, but there's also lots of people that agree with me on that. And that's kind of what makes the world go round. But it also, everybody learns differently. And so, um, if some, some people might learn to play this game better by thinking about their body movements, um, and, and I don't discount that. My experience has been that most people learn better by thinking about the golf club and how to swing it, but I don't discount that, there, that some people can think about their body. You asked me about a knee movement thing earlier that you, that we, that you saw online. Um, I'd never ever heard anybody talk about that specific movement before. In my opinion, too much to think about. <laughs> um, but hey, if you want to try it and think about it, I, I still think that's what's fun about this game is, is experimenting yeah. on stuff and, and figuring out for you what works. Mm -hmm. I've got a story if you don't mind me telling sure, it. Sure, let's, let's hear it. One of the things Patrick asked me about off camera too was, you know, should I exaggerate going outside and looping under to get a feel for um, um, swinging more to the right on the way down, like Jim Furyk, yeah. right? And so, you know, it'd look something like this and you'd feel the club swing under. Should I do that? I said, absolutely yes, right? <laughs> I love hitting flop shots and lob shots mm -hmm. on short game exaggerating that. If you really want to hit a correct lob flop shot, go outside and under and it will surprise you. Bunker is a great way to hit bunker shots. We're going to do a bunker video. We get asked a lot about bunkers. Patrick asks a lot oh, about I'm bunkers. I'm terrified of those things. And so once it gets green here in Missouri and it looks halfway decent in our bunkers and all that, we'll be doing a bunker video that'll blow the internet up, I promise. <laughs> so, so keep tuned for that. One of the stories I'll tell you, I won't name names, but um, when I was pretty young still, um, I think it was probably the first um, PGA of America teaching and coaching summit that I attended. It was in New Orleans. And they actually rented out the Superdome and we all sat in the end zone seats and they had a stage in the end zone and people could hit balls and all the best well-known instructors of that time were there. Jim Flick and, yeah. and um, Jimmy Ballard and it, it was just amazing. And, um, and for me, you know, I was in my early 30s probably and um, I was just blown away. And we stayed, I can't remember if it's a Hyatt or a Marriott, what it was back then that was right next door to the Superdome. And so I went down to have a cocktail one night after 
the very first day. And one of the famous instructors um, was sitting at a table by himself. And I just asked if I could sit down and join him. And so I bought a couple drinks and asked him questions. And he could, would have talked all night, I think, if I'd have kept buying <laughs> single malt scotches. And um, he told me um, a story about Ben Hogan and how Ben Hogan practiced every day before he hit balls. And I don't know if it's true or not. I have a feeling it likely is. But I would tell you this, let me switch clubs with you. According to this guy, Ben Hogan every day, and you talked about going out and then under, it would take him a half an hour to do this, supposedly, before he started hitting balls. He would set up with a club and he would go out and under, out and under. Then he'd go an inch farther back, out and then under, and he'd go out and then under, and then out, and then under, and then out, and then under, and then out, and then under, until he got to the top of his backswing. And it would take him a half an hour uh, from start to the top of his backswing every day to feel that. So arguably the best practicer and the best ball striker of all time, you know, that's how he would start every session is out, and then under, and then out, and then under, and that's how what he would do every day. I, that's one of the things from 1992 or whatever, or 94, yeah. I can't remember when it was, that I remember the most from that, but <laughs> you might consider doing that at home. So that ought to answer the question you gave me off yeah. camera earlier, should I practice like that? And well, you know, if Hogan was going out and under and up and under to feel what it felt like to swing more to the right, um, I think, and get create lag. Yep. That's what he was doing, was creating lag. And um, I think everybody should try to do it. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed trying it myself. It seems like it's really been helping me a bit. So. Uh -huh, good. And so, but to answer your question about early extension, I would tell most players if you're really happy with how you're hitting it, and you're really happy with how you're playing, and you know you're early extending, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're really having issues, and you really think that's what's wrong, well then find out why you have to early extend, because there's something that is making you have to do it, if you ask me. And it may be trying to create speed that you don't have, or it's creating a club head that's probably bottoming out too far behind the ball and you're early extending so you don't slam the club in the ground. Yep. Okay? Cool. All right. Sounds good. Yep.